We are so excited about our Christmas Eve services and we have a lot of special things planned so make sure you invite your friends and your family to your campus. At our South Haven and Olive Branch campus we have service times at 3 p.m. 4.30 and 6 p.m. And then at our Hernando and West campuses, we have service times at 4.30 and then 6 p.m. We can't wait to see you there. What's up, you guys? Hey, we are so excited because an event that we call United Day and Night is coming up very, very shortly on December 13th and 14th. We do this event each year because we want to empower students to take a step deeper in their relationship with God and in their relationships with His people. Uh, during that Friday and Saturday, there's going to be things like worship, there's going to be live messages from people uh, just all over our staff. We're going to have breakout sessions, Q&A sessions. We're going to teach students how to dive into their own Bible. And so we feel like it's a can't miss kind of event. Friday night is going to be free. And then Saturday, we're going all day and it's going to be a charge of $30. That's going to cover breakfast, lunch, snacks throughout the day, a t-shirt, a devotional book that we're giving them to take home. There's gonna be other giveaways throughout the day as well. We promise that it's something that your student wants to be a part of and needs to be a part of. And so you can register right now on the website or on the app. You can actually scholarship a student and you can apply for a scholarship if money is an issue at all. That $30 rate is only gonna last until the end of November and then it's gonna go up uh, by $5 in December. And so we encourage you to do it as soon as possible. We love you so much and uh, we hope to see you on the 13th and 14th. That's all of the announcements for this week, so get ready for this week's message. Hey, hey, welcome to the weekend. Is everybody awake and out of your turkey coma, I hope? Yes, amen, amen. Um, before we get too, too far along, I just want to, we've been trying to be real diligent about celebrating the things that God is doing here at Life Fellowship Church. And, and one of the things that I get the privilege of doing is um, putting together a, a women's conference that actually occurred in October. And the women that gathered, I, it's just amazing. The women that gathered, I issued a challenge to them that we wanted to raise between $5,000 and $10,000 in the room to provide embrace packages for some ladies in, uh, that are in the neighborhood program of Watoto for Juba, South Sudan. They're breaking into another country and they're not keeping it just in Uganda, but they're going into South Sudan. And our women at that women's conference raised $7,000. Can we celebrate that together? Thank you so much for being so faithful and so diligent. Um, it, it's, it's amazing because what that does is that's gonna give 70 women in South Sudan an embrace package and those of you that were in the room understand what the embrace package was I, I don't have time to really fully go into all the detail about an embrace package but thank you so much and so I would like before I go even further is to welcome all of you that are watching from all of our campuses Olive Branch South Haven Hernando West and the women at God Behind Bars and the men in Parchment so thank you so much can we welcome everybody the weekend we are a clappy church right so there is a, there was a holiday that just occurred, and then we're full-fledged throngs into the middle of another one, and it's Christmas. You know, and then as you go around, there's so many things that symbolize Christmas, right? When you, when you see the sights, and you smell the scents, and you hear the sounds, there's things like gingerbread cookies, there's wreaths with bows on them. There's jingle bells. There's candy canes. Uh, there's Santa Claus, right? All of these are symbols of Christmas, right? There's also another symbol of Christmas, if you will, and it's this. It's the nativity. And a lot of times, those of us that are in um, the faith community, we tend to have these in our home, and um, we, we, we make a reference to it. And sometimes when we want to be really affectionate, we go, oh, sweet baby Jesus. You know, in a southern vernacular, when there's something that's um, sweet or tender or something like that, especially around this time, I hear this quite often, is that we refer to the nativity as a symbol 
And we say just about, we don't talk about Joseph, handsome, burly Joseph. Or we don't say, oh, dainty Mother Mary. No, we refer to the baby in the manger, and we call him sweet baby Jesus. And so what I want us to do this weekend is I want us to get past this idea that this little baby in a manger was just a symbol. So I want you to fill in the blank if you got your notes out, and I want to pose a question. Is Jesus merely a symbol of Christmas, or is Jesus the substance of Christmas? So we tend to think that this nativity scene is just a symbol. We put it out. Hey, I have one in my house. Uh, it won't be out this year because we've moved and it's probably in a box somewhere. But the symbol of Christmas, especially to those in the faith community. But can I tell you that those that are not saved and they're unbelievers and they're unconvinced, this baby in a manger isn't going to help them much when they're hungry. This baby isn't going to help them much when they're sad and they're hurting, right? Right? So I want us to navigate through these waters of taking that sweet baby Jesus as a symbol of Christmas to seeing how much that the, the Savior Jesus is the substance of Christmas. Amen? There's a quote, and I think it's in your handouts, but it's by G.K. Chesterton. It says, Christmas is built upon a beautiful and intentional paradox that the birth of the homeless should be celebrated in every home. Isn't that amazing? And that's true. Luke 2, verses 7, it tells us that she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So in a sense, they were homeless. And, you know, 2,000 years forward, we are celebrating and we're using this symbol. And we're celebrating the homeless in every home. And so I want us to think about that. I want us to think about the times when we just referred to this time of the year only to the sweet baby Jesus, this baby in a manger, instead of pointing people to the Savior Jesus, that this baby actually grew up. He became a man. And then in 1 John, in John 1.14, he tells us, said the word became human, and he made his home among us. So he's not just this symbol, this plastic thing that we can sit on our counters or put in our yards or anything like that. He was a human. He could be pinched. He could be touched. He could be held. He could be hugged. And that is the Jesus that during this time right now at Christmas when there's so many things to be distraught about, to be angry about, to be complaining about, we need people to see the Jesus with flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? There's few, things in, uh, there's few things that communicate acceptance and warmth as much as touch and being physically present, right? And children are really, they know this concept really well. And I remember when my son was younger, if you were sitting on the couch or if he was sitting near you, it wasn't enough for him to sit beside of you and watch TV. He had to be like sitting on you and he had to be touching you. He, there was something that he had to touch on you because he, he understood the fact that if I can touch you, I feel safe and I feel secure. And it reminds me of this story of a mom. And uh, there was a really bad thunderstorm one night. And she goes into her little girl's room, and she wants to comfort her. And so she goes into the room, and she kneels down beside of her bed, uh, trying to comfort her little girl. And she's holding her hand, and she goes, "Don't, baby, it's okay. Don't worry. Jesus is here, and he's going to protect you. And so the baby girl, she, you know, she just looks up at her with those big eyes, little tears kind of coming down. And she's like, okay, Mommy, you sleep here with Jesus, and I'm going to go sleep with Daddy. So the idea that people need touch, they need somebody that's physically there beside of them to feel secure and to feel safe. It's not uncommon, even when we grow up to be an adult. We want to know that somebody is there. They're touchable. They're approachable. And I, can I tell you that this sweet baby Jesus in a manger that we use as a symbol for Christmas, that isn't going to cut it. People need to know that there is a touchable, there is an approachable there is a Savior that can, can give them security and can keep them safe through all of the things in life. When they think about Christmas, they don't need to just be thinking about this sweet baby Jesus in a manger. They need to know that there is a Savior that can heal them, that can feed them, that can walk with them through the tough and just save them from their sins. Amen? Just like a baby, you know, doesn't take care of itself, 
um, it needs help. It needs to, it's constantly being taken care of. There's nothing that it can do by itself. So why on earth would we as Christ followers, those of us that are convinced of the claims of Christ, can t- keep, keep allowing people that are unconvinced to think, oh, this sweet baby Jesus can help you do anything. I'm thankful that sweet baby Jesus came to earth because that's why we can celebrate Christmas. But I want others to know that, you know what, this sweet baby Jesus, he did. He was a man. He grew up. And he can walk with you through anything. He can show you things in your life. And he can guide you in all things, right? Think about it this way. What if you and your family decided to go on a road trip? You packed up your car and you decided to hit the highway. You got a map, not Google. Imagine that. It's a really great concept. Young people, try it. A map is a great thing. You get on the highway and you're just rolling, okay? And then you approach a very large city that has the most ridiculous streets and intersections. And I just don't know who the city planner was at Atlanta. And you get, you end up finding yourself off of the main highway and into downtown Atlanta. If any of you have ever experienced that, it's horrible. It's horrendous. Now, those of you that are in Atlanta, love you. Okay, but your streets are a little awkward, all right? So you found yourself off of the main highway, and now you're in downtown Atlanta, the busy streets, chaotic intersections, people are everywhere, you're lost. And so you stop and you ask for directions a few different times. You even stop and ask a cop, hey, how can I get out here? And you try to, and, and you just feel like you're just running the same streets. You're not going anywhere, but all the same, you see in these people on Peachtree Boulevard or Avenue, whatever you want to call it, and they're feeling like, I mean, they look like they're going where they're going. They know where they're going, and they're getting there. And you and your little family on your little road trip are just circling, and you're lost. So and out of your frustration, one more time, you decide, I'm going to go into one more gas station. And you stop at the gas station, and you go in there, and you're asking, hey, we need directions. We're lost. we got to get back onto the highway. Can you help us? And they're telling you the same directions. And you're looking at them going, yep, we did that. We went that road. This is not working for us. So while you're having this conversation with, this, with the attendant at the gas station, there is a very nice, very trusting stranger that's hearing your conversation. And he interrupts and he says, hey, he says, I, I, I hear that you're lost. He said, if you don't mind, I, my car is just right out here. If you'll follow me, I'll show you the way. And so you're like, yes, somebody that's actually willing to, to show us the way out instead of just telling us what to do. So sure enough, you, pack, you get your and your family into your car and you follow this guy. And he is doing it. He's navigating you through those crazy streets, through those chaotic intersections. And before you know it, you are back at the highway where you're supposed to be. He pulls over and he says, hey, you can't get lost from here. Just stay on this road. That's how Jesus is. And people that are lost and they feel like they're just in, they're, there's in chaotic times, they feel like they're just running in circles in their life. They don't need for people just to tell them, hey, here are the instructions, go for it, go find your way out. They need a savior, Jesus, to come and say, follow me, I will show you the way. And that's what we need to show people during this time of the year. We have an amazing opportunity at Christmas time. People are more open to hearing the gospel. Why don't we take it one step further? Not just sweet baby Jesus in a manger, but the Savior that you can follow through all of your life. And he will show you exactly where to go and what to do forever and always. Amen? So there's a very simple thing. So here's the question then. If we want to show people that the sweet baby Jesus isn't just a symbol, that he actually is the substance, the savior of Christmas, then how do we take people, so in your handout, how do we graduate people from just thinking, oh, sweet baby Jesus in the manger as a symbol of Christmas to understanding and accepting the savior Jesus at Christmas. Three simple things. And if you've been around here at Life Fellowship Church, you've probably heard these three simple things before. But I think it's so pertinent for us during this time to help people see if we are convinced of the claims of Christ, then these are the things that we must live by. The first thing, and I made these very grammatically incorrect. And the reason I did that was so that it, we would remember it. If things are so polished, you know, in the, in the grammar and English and everything like that, I think sometimes we just smooth over it. And we just kind of forget about it. But if we make it like a little, like a, like a high-pitched noise that kind of gets your attention, then I feel like we'll remember it a little bit better, okay? Or at least 
you can entertain me in that way. The first thing, fill in your blank. For us to be able to move people from just thinking about sweet baby Jesus as a symbol to the Savior Jesus of Christmas, we be relevant. Fill in the blank, relevant. And all relevant is, is just being appropriate to the time and the circumstance. And what better person, the only person that walked on this earth was more relevant than Jesus. Wherever he was, whatever he did, he was relevant in the time. He was touchable. He was approachable. Yes, he was the salvation of all mankind, but still yet, he would touch somebody and pray for them for their body to be healed of a sickness. He even broke the bread and fed the people when they were hungry. He was relevant. And so for us to be able to show, to not be so uncomfortable about sharing a little bit more about this Jesus of Christmas, not just the baby, but the man that grew and then ended up dying on a cross for all of us, then we need to be relevant. If you see somebody that's struggling, say, uh, and actually there is a story. I have a dear friend, Rachel Miller, uh, she's on our staff. She told me about this instance. She said she was coming into the office at the South Haven campus, and there was a daycare attached to our South Haven campus. And there was a young mother. She had two. She had a baby holding the baby in her arm, and she had a toddler, probably two, that was kind of representing the terrible twos. He was screaming his lungs out. And she said at that moment, she saw the young mother just get down on the ground and kneel. And she just laid her head onto the vehicle. And she just sat there. She's got a baby in her arms and a toddler going bananas. Now, what Rachel could have done is she could have gone and said, you need sweet Jesus. I will pray for you. But no, she didn't just go over there or she didn't even just look. She walked over there and said, can I help you in any way? And that little mom, just she, her whole body, Rachel said, just melted. That somebody was actually relevant in the time. Didn't just give her a brow beating. Didn't tell her, hey, this is what you should and shouldn't do. She offered herself as a walking example of Jesus with skin on. Amen. Be relevant. Let's be relevant. We don't. We know that they have a spiritual need. We all have a spiritual need. But that's what the amazing thing that Jesus did. He saw their felt need. He he met the felt need. He didn't dismiss their spiritual need, but sometimes you've got to meet a felt need before people will be even open to hearing the gospel. Isn't that right? So let's just be relevant in the time. The next thing you can fill in your blank is we be authentic. You know, the definition of authentic is something that's made or done in a way that faithfully resembles an original. Faithfully resembles an original. Again, Jesus is the utmost amazing example of authenticity. And we find this in John chapter 5, verses 19 through 23. This is, the, this is Jesus' uh, certificate of authentication, if you will. It says, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. For just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the father judges no one. Instead, he has given the son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the son just as they honor the father. Anyone who does not honor the son is certainly not honoring the father who sent him. That is is authenticity. Jesus was resembling, faithfully resembling the original. The original is God the Father. Amen. But he doesn't just leave it there. We don't just look at that and go, oh, well, great. You know, I'm never going to get that certificate of authentication. Okay, that's a little too much for me. But he, but Jesus gives us a template of authenticity. And it's found in John chapter Chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. He says, so I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you are my true followers. Authentic. You know, Jesus authorized only one identifying mark as his followers, and that's if you love one another. It's not by your knowledge of scripture. It's not by your style of clothes. It's not by your church membership. It's not even by your orthodoxy. It's by your love that properly brands you as an authentic Christ follower. 
And because Jesus was fully man and fully God, he can sympathize with our humanity. The, the difference is that he was tempted in all ways, just as we are tempted in all ways, but he did not sin. So what that does is it frees you and me to be humble, it, uh, to own our own humanity, to not hide in the presence of our friends, and to not put on a mask of spirituality when it's not there. It's okay. To learn to be honest with ourselves and to be free to be forgiven and to forgive others. That is what being authentic means. So we don't have to go around being fake and saying, hey, oh, my life is all hunky-dunky. It's so glorious and everything like that. You can be authentic. You can be who you are. And Jesus set the template for us. He faithfully resembled the original, which is God the Father. And then we also have the template to resemble Jesus because he is the original. So we can be authentic in showing people that Jesus, the sweet baby Jesus, can be what they need him to be in their time of suffering and also in their time of celebration. Amen? And the last thing I want you to fill in there is we be fun, which means just be joy-filled. There's so many things that we can look around in our own life, in our neighbor's life, in our community, in our culture, in our world that we can be complaining about, that we can be down about, that we can be depressed about. But God did not say that. He did not want us to be that way. Now, that's the part of being authentic. Okay, when you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. But guess what? You can choose to be joyful. Because joy, it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter on your circumstance. That's happiness. Joy is a choice, and there's so many times in the Bible that it wasn't just a recommendation to be joyful. It was an exclamation. Check it out. John 15, 11, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. How will your joy overflow? It's because you're filled with his joy, not happiness. It's his joy. Philippians 4, 4, always be joyful in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. There's an exclamation mark. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, always be joyful joyful. You know, when people want to know about how good a God is, our God is especially, or if that he's real, if he's relevant, they look at us. We're the, we're the marker at this point. If we, if we go around and we're so sad and we're so down, downtrodden, and if we're in a time that we're really just seeking the Lord and we're fasting and we look like we're fasting, or, you know, we're just saying, oh, God, he's good and he's faithful, but, you know, I'm just still here. That's, that doesn't work, folks. That's, that is a paradox. You can't in one breath say, oh, God is good and look like, you know, you just sucked on a lemon. We have to be joy, joy-filled, have fun. So that's why we set that out at Life Fellowship Church, is that we're relevant, authentic, and fun. It's nothing new under the sun. It's just nothing. It's, and it's not just a catchy three things that we say around here. Because I believe that God wants us to be that way. And especially during this time of the year when people are more open to hearing the gospel, let's, let's, let's graduate them from that sweet baby Jesus in a manger that isn't going to help them when they've lost their job. Or when they're facing a terminal illness right in the face. Or when maybe depression is so heavy on them that they don't feel like they can get up the next day. We need to point them to the Savior Jesus. He's still the Savior. He's still Jesus of Christmas. He's just now the grown-up version that can help them and not just a baby that's just sitting there needing to be needed all the time. Amen. I believe that unconvinced people would rather see a sermon than hear one. So that means that we must... Just, we must be walking the word of God, not just talking the word of God. Because people don't just need a lot of scripture thrown at them whenever they're sad and depressed or they're going through a hard time. They need you to walk with them. And they need to see that the Jesus that you're talking about is the Jesus in your life. And that he has walked with you through some times. You see, people always want to show their, their highlight reel. And they want to show their mountaintop experiences. But you forget God grew you in the valley experiences. And that, and that same God that grew you through a valley experience can do the same for somebody else. And so we don't, we don't need to hide, you know, those down moments because that's when people see that God is real. He's authentic. He's relevant in the time. And then when we express our goodness, we express our appreciation to the goodness of God, we are joy-filled. It's very much a choice, and I believe that we can do that. Amen? So what I want us to do, I want to issue a challenge for us for this Christmas season. 
is I want us to be relevant, authentic, and fun with our faith, with our sweet baby Jesus this Christmas. Is when we have the opportunity to engage somebody about where they are in their life at the present moment, that we don't just defer it to, oh, this is Christmas, and we celebrate Jesus' birth only. No. We celebrate the starting point of the rest of their life when we can point them past that sweet baby Jesus, just a symbol to the substance of Christmas. Like I said, a baby can't help somebody when they are in need, but a Savior can. And so the challenge I want to issue to all of us is if you, when I, when I read this challenge, and if you say, yes, I'm going to do that, I'm going to want, I want you to stand. I want you to commit to it, that this Christmas season, that this is what you're going to do, that you're going to be relevant in your expressions of God's love. You're going to be authentic in your own redeemed humanity. And you're going to be fun in your, and your joy-filled, if you will, in your attitude towards others and yourself. If that challenges for you this entire Christmas season, then I want you to stand. I want you to stand and say, that's me. I'm going to be relevant and authentic and fun with my faith this Christmas season. I'm not going to just, just be celebrating like everybody else, this sweet baby Jesus in a manger. But I'm going to be, I'm going to be relevant to what I see people's needs are. I'm going to be authentically me. And those of you that are in prison, you can be relevant where you are. When you see someone that's in in need of prayer, pray for them. And be authentically you. God doesn't want to change you. He wants to use you. He does want to change some of your patterns and your ways. But he wants to use you just the way you are because you can reach people that nobody else can reach. So be relevant, authentic, and be joyful right where you are. So I want, to, I want to encourage all of us to do that. No matter where we are, whether we're in the workplace, whether we're at school, whether we're in our very own home, let's be relevant. Let's not just spout out scriptures just because we should and we haven't memorized. Let's make sure that we're relevant in the time. And let's be authentic. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to be, you know, whatever, because you think that their story is better than yours. Your te- their testimony is better than yours. No. Be faithfully resembling the original, and the original is God the Father. And let's have fun. Let's have fun this Christmas. Let's be different. Let's not complain. Let's not gossip. Let's have fun. Let's be joy-filled. And let's show a hurting world that this baby Jesus, this symbol of sweet baby Jesus, can do more for them than they could ever imagine. Amen. I want to pray for us. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that you did come. You chose to come to earth as a baby. And thank you, God, that you didn't just stay a baby, but you grew up into the fullness of a man, that you could feel everything. You could feel joy. You could feel pain. And you could understand everything that we could ever go through so that we could never say you don't know. And, Father, I pray for every single person that has accepted the challenge in this room that, Father God, you will infuse them, dear God, with energy, with spirit, dear God, with love. But, God, also give them wisdom to recognize where they are and in the moment. But, Father, to be approachable and touchable just as you were. We thank you, Father God, that you gave us a template. You sent Jesus here to show us the way. You didn't just give us a bunch of instructions in your word, but, God, you sent your son to show us. And we thank you for it. And we will be faithful to be relevant, authentic, and fun this Christmas season. In your precious name we pray. Amen.